Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show. I'm Paul, aka the host with about as much personality as Michael Myers, and in this video we're breaking down Fear Street Part 1 1994. The first chapter in the Netflix trilogy has a lot to unpack from it, and over the next three weeks we'll be going through the ins and outs of the film's saga. Now the series is based on the book of the same name from R.L. Stein, who you might know from making your crappy pants as a kid with his Goosebumps series. Stein was very much the Stephen King of my middle school library, and growing up I think I must have had over 40 of his books. He's the person that really got me interested in the horror genre, so naturally when I heard Fear Street was being made into a Netflix trilogy, I couldn't wait to sink my fangs into it. Now the film itself is based heavily on the slasher genre, and in it there are nods to Halloween, Friday the 13th, and of course Scream, which was released in 1996. That movie opened with the murder of Drew Barrymore, which came as a big shock to everyone, as she was a very established actor at the time. This idea of killing off a name in the early part of a film was actually playing on Psycho, and Fear Street has its own homage to that. In the introduction of the film, we watch as a mall worker is murdered, and she's played by none other than Maya Hawke, Maya he, Maya ha ha. Now the killer themselves wears a skull mask, and it's clear they're playing tribute to that classic 90s film. There's also nods to other horror properties from the decade, at least I think there is, as the two towns we focus on are Shadyside and Sunnyvale, which I think might be a nod to Sunnydale, the town that Buffy the Vampire Slayer was set in. Now that might be a reach, and this might not be the best time to ask for a like, but if you don't, then tonight at midnight, when you're in bed, you'll look up and see me above you, and I'll spoil the ending of No Way Home. The subscribe button's there too whilst you're at it. Now this movie is very fourth wall breaking and it opens with Maya's character Heather sticking her fingers up to a customer at the mall that calls a book she loved lowbrow horror. RL is really sticking his fingers up here to people who didn't like the haunted mask. What's wrong with you? It's a classic. Now there's also books by Robert Lawrence, which no prizes for guessing is what RL stands for. This most notably appears on one titled Fear Street, which they did it. Now Sunnyvale's team are also called the Devils, and the number 666 appears throughout the film. We can see that Heather's killer Ryan was fine moments before he went on his murder spree, but a mysterious fly landed on his neck, and clearly this changed his demeanour. Flies are often known to be vessels of witches, and this is why Cicada showed up in one division. Maya was of course killed, and Ryan was shot dead by the local sheriff, Nick Good. Good shot, bad timing. Oh, these videos are terrible. Now, strangely, killings like this have been going on in Shadyside for hundreds of years, reoccurring every couple of decades, and this dates back all the way to 1666, which, no prizes for guessing, has 666 in it. We know that Part 3 will be set during this year, with 1978 being the next stop, so clearly we're going to learn all the ins and outs of what has plagued this town for centuries. We discover that at the core of the curse is a witch named Sarah Fear, who the settlers of Shadyside hanged in 1666 for practicing witchcraft. Sarah cast a spell on the town that's allowed her to possess people in order to wreak havoc and kill the descendants of those that hanged her. We get lip service to other killers such as a pastor named Cyrus Miller who murdered children in 1666. There was a man that killed girls in 1904, one in 1922, as well as an axe murderer that killed several teens at Camp Nightwing in 1978. This is the setting for the next film, and it's clearly pulling from the first Friday the 13th movie. Now after the title sequence, we pick up with Dina, a high school student that recently broke up with her girlfriend Sam. Sam moved to the neighbouring peaceful town of Sunnyvale, which has a rivalry with Shadyside. This kind of spills over into the main plot when the football teams end up fighting at a vigil for the victims. They chase the Shadysiders out of town, and Dina almost ends up throwing a bucket of ice onto their car. However, after her nose starts to bleed, she drops the entire thing, causing those from Sunnyvale to crash into a tree. This was clearly the work of the witch, and Sam climbs out of the car, seeing a vision of her after touching the ground. Sam is taken to hospital, and slowly, stranger things start to happen, with a mysterious skull mask wearing character stalking the cast. We discover that Dina and her group of friends have all seen the same figure, and at one point Dina unmasks him to see that it's Ryan, who of course died at the start of the movie. More long dead thought killers arrive, and we realise that they can't be stopped, spoken to or bargained with. These relentless killing machines are invincible, and they start to hunt the group. Through Josh we discover the truth about the killers, and learn that Sam is actually the only target of Sarah. 
It's revealed that after the accident, she ended up touching the witch's bones as they lay in the dirt and this is what set off the curse once more. Now the group race against time to find out how to stop the killers and along the way, the killers get the group of friends one by one. Up until probably the last 40 minutes, I thought the movie was pretty tame, but they really take the cake with some of the killings. Thank you, I'm here all week. Now they realise that the only way to save Sam is to kill her, and then when the murderers are gone, bring her back to life. This works, and when Sam dies, the murderers disappear, allowing for Dina to resuscitate the character. They lie to the police and say that there wasn't anything supernatural, and poor Kate and Simon end up taking the blame. And the movie ends strangely with Dina getting a call from a woman who we learn was the sole survivor of Camp Nightwing. She tells her that it's not over and warns that the witch will still be after her. We get this confirmed when we catch a witch in a coven carrying out a spell which engraves Sam's name into stone just below Ryan's. Much like Ryan became possessed, Sam does too and she stabs Dina. Now luckily this doesn't kill the character and she manages to tie Sam up with a telephone cord. Both Dina and Josh go to visit the sole survivor C. Berman, who we see is played by Jillian Jacobs from Community. We then get some flashbacks to the camp and what happened there. Now, though we know C died and that this left her the curse, we still don't know exactly how she came to survive the entire ordeal for several decades. Clearly there is something else afoot here and Dina promises that she will free Sam of her possession. Now the next entry, like we mentioned, is clearly pulling from Friday the 13th and I have a feeling that a twist might be that C is actually part of the possessed herself. Hell, she may even be the one carrying out the rituals that we saw to keep the curse going and this would explain why she was spared in the first place. It just seems weird that the curse suddenly stopped yet continued with the others when they followed the same steps. I think that going forward, there could be a big reveal. There's also that strange person on instant messenger that Josh is talking to. And I believe that this could also be C as well. Hell, everyone see if you ask me, as that's the only character we don't really know that much about. Now, I also think that somehow the characters may end up travelling back to 1978 and also 1666 in order to perhaps learn things about the past. I think that's way better than simply seeing things from another's perspective, and there's really no way for us to connect with a character from the latter year as they'd be long dead by now. Either way though, we won't have to wait much longer, and next Friday we'll see the release of part 2, which I will no doubt be covering. I had a lot of fun with this first entry, and I'm excited to see where the trilogy goes. Now obviously I'd love to hear your thoughts on the first part, so make sure you comment below and let me know. As a thank you for interacting with the video, you'll be entered into a prize draw on the 30th of July, in which we pick 3 random comments so you can win an MCU box set of your choice. All you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on part 1. The winners of last month's competition are on screen right now, so if that's you, then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, then make sure you check out our breakdown of Loki, which will be linked on screen right now. We've gone over the latest episode from top to bottom, so it's definitely worth checking out if you want to know more. With that out of the way, thank you for seeing through the video. I've been Paul, and I'll see you next time. Take care. Peace.